Mrs. Barlow? Mrs. Barlow? I'm rather thick. What do you want to bet we're not snowed up tomorrow? Oh dear, I do hope not. We'll have to tell if the pipes don't freeze. We'll have to keep the central heating well stoked. Hmm, not too good. I wish they'd send the coal along. He hasn't got any too much. Do you still want everything to go well at first? First impressions are so important. Is everything all right? Nobody's arrived yet, I suppose. No, thank goodness. Mrs. Barlow hooked it early, though. Very the weather, I suppose. What a nuisance these dairy women are. That leaves everything on your shoulders. And yours. This is a partnership. No, yours, so long as you don't ask me to cook. No, yeah, that's my department. Anyway, we've got lots of tins in case we're snowed up. Charles, do you think it's going to be all right? You've got cold feet, have you? Are you sorry now we didn't sell the place when your aunt left it to you instead of having this mad idea of running it as a guest house? No, I'm not. I love it. And talking of a guest house, just look at that. Pretty good, what? It's a disaster, don't you see? You left out the S. It reads Monkwell instead of Monkswell. Good Lord, so I did. Oh, well, it doesn't really matter. Monkwell is a good name. You're in disgrace. You're in Stoke, so too heat. Across that icy yard. Oh. Shall I bang it up for the night now? No, you don't do that till 10 or 11 o'clock. How appalling. Hurry up, someone may arrive any minute. Uh, have you got all the rooms worked out? Yes, I think so. Mrs. Moore, your Frank Corpo's room. Major Metcalf, blue room. Miss Hazel and Mr. Red Oak room. I wonder what all these people will be like. Aren't we to have gotten rent in advance? No, I don't think so. We're rather mugs at this game. Well, they bring luggage. If they don't pay, we keep their luggage. It's quite simple. I can't help thinking we should have taken a correspondence course in hotel keeping. We're sure to get had in some way. The luggage may just be bricks wrapped in newspaper, and where should we be then? Your wrote some very good addresses. That's what servants with forged references do. Some of these people may just be criminals hiding to the police. Well, I don't care what they are, just so long as they pay us seven guineas a week. You're such a wonderful woman of business, Molly. According to Scotland Yard, the crime took place at 24 Culver Street, Paddington. The murdered woman was Mrs. Maureen Lyon. In connection with the murder, police are anxious to interview a man seen in the vicinity wearing a dark overcoat, light scarf, and a soft felt hat. Motorists were warned against ice down roads. Heavy snow is expected to continue, but throughout the country there will be certain freezing, particularly at points in the north. Thanks so much. Weather is simply awful. My taxi gave up at your gate. Wouldn't attempt the drive. No sporting instinct. Are you Mrs. Ralston? How delightful. My name is Ray. How do you do, Mr. Ray? You know, you're not at all as I pictured you. I thought you'd be a retired generous widow, Indian Army. I pictured you as terrifically grim and so memsahibish. And that this place will be simply crowned with Benares brass. Instead, it's heavenly. 
quite heavenly. Lovely proportions. Mm. That is a fake. Ah, but this, however, is genuine. And I'm simply going to love it here. Uh, do you have any wax flowers or birds of paradise? No, I'm afraid not. Mm, what a pity. Well, uh, what about a cyborg? A purple, plummy, mahogany cyborg with great solid carved fruits on it? Yes, we have, in the dining room. In here? I must see it. Oh, simply lovely. Oh, it was an adorable vase. Where did you pick that up? Well, do come in and warm yourself, then. Absolutely perfect. Real bedrock respectability. Uh, however, Mrs. Ralston, why do you do away with the center mahogany table? Little tables just spoil the effect. Well, we thought the guests would prefer them. At least it's my husband. How do you do? Terrible weather, isn't it? Brings one back to Dickens and Scrooge and that irritating tiny Tim. So bogus. Uh, but Mrs. Ralston, you're absolutely right about little tables. I was taken by my feeling for period. After all, if you had a center mahogany dining table, you'd have to have the right family round it. Stern, handsome father with the beard. Prolific, faded mother. Eleven children of assaulted ages. A grim governess. And someone called Paul Harriet, the poor relation of the family, who acts as General Dog's body and is very, very grateful for being given a good home. I'll take your suitcase upstairs for you. Book room, did you say? Yes. I would do so if it has a fall poster with little chintz roses. It hasn't. My dear, I don't believe your husband is going to like me. Have you been married long? Are you very much in love? We've been married just a year. Perhaps you'd like to go up and see your room. Tip off? But I do so like knowing all about people. I mean, I find people madly interesting, don't you? Well, I suppose some are and some are not. No, I don't agree. They're all interesting. Because you never really know what a person is thinking about or what they're really like. For example, you don't know what I'm thinking about right now, do you? Not the least. Cigarette? Uh, no, thank you. You see, the only people who know what other people are like are artists. And they don't know why they know it. And if they portrait paint this, it comes out on the canvas. Are you a painter? Me? No, no, I'm an architect. My parents, you know, baptized me Christopher Wren and hoped that I would be an architect. Christopher Wren. <laughs> as good as halfway home. Carlos, everyone used to make jokes about St. Paul's. However, who knows? I may yet have the last laugh. Chris Wren's prefab nests may yet go down in history. I'm going to like it here. I find your wife most sympathetic. Indeed. And really quite beautiful. <laughs> and it shall be absurd. There, isn't that like an English woman? Compliments always embarrass them. European women take compliments as a matter of course. But English women have all their feminine spirit crushed out of them by their husbands. I find something very boorish about English husbands. Come up and see your room. Oh, shall I? Just drop the hot water boiler. I'm Charles Walston. Won't you come into the fire, Mrs. Boyle, and get warm? Awful weather we're having, isn't it? Uh, is this your only luggage? Uh, Major Madcalf is seeing to it. Oh, I'll just go near the door for you. The taxi wouldn't risk coming up the drive. It stopped at the gate. We had to share a taxi from the station, and there was a great difficulty in getting that. Nothing ordered to meet us, it seems. Oh, I'm so sorry. We had no idea what train would be coming by. Otherwise, of course, we'd have seen that someone was standing by. All trains should have been met. Uh, I'm so sorry. My wife will be done in a minute. I'll just go and help Metcalf along with the bags. The drive might at least have been cleared of snow. Most off-hand and casual, I must say. Oh, I'm so sorry. Mrs. Ralston, yes. You're very young. Young? To be running an establishment of this kind. You can't have had much experience. Well, there has to be a beginning for everything, hasn't there? I see. Quite inexperienced. An old, old house. I certainly hope you haven't got dry rot. Certainly not. A lot of people don't know they've got dry rot until it's too late to do anything about it. The house is in perfect condition. 
Hmm. It could do with a coat of paint. You know you've got worm in his own. This way, Major. Major Metcalf, this is my wife, Molly. How do you do? Absolute blizzard outside. Thought at one time we shouldn't make it. Oh, beg your pardon. Uh, the game keeps up like this. We should have five or six feet of snow by morning. I uh, haven't seen anything like it since I was on leave in 1940. I'll take your suitcases upstairs. A little room in the Rose Room, did you say? No, I ended up putting Mr. Red in the Rose Room. We like the four poster so much. So it's Major Metcalf in the Blue Room and Mrs. Boyle in the East Room. Okay, uh, Major. Sir. Would you mind grabbing the spectrum? Sir. Thank you. Do you have much servant difficulty here? We've quite a lot of who comes in from the village. I see. And what indoor staff? No indoor staff, just us. I would have said that a proper staff of servants was essential before opening this kind of establishment. I understood that it was fully equipped with all of the home comfort. Well, we're only just starting. As I said, I understood that it was fully equipped and that I would have thought that a servant was essential. We can't afford them. May I ask if I'm the only guest? With Major Metcalf, that is. No, there's several here. This weather, too. A blizzard, no less. All very unfortunate. You couldn't very well foresee the weather. The north wind doth blow, and it will bring snow. And what will the robin do then, poor thing? <laughs> I shall be dawn, Mercy Rhymes, don't you? Always so tragic and macabre. That's why children like them. May I introduce? Mr. Ray, Mrs. Bono. How do you do? This is a very beautiful house, don't you think so? I have come to the time of life when the amenities of an establishment are more important than its appearance. If I had not believed that it was a running concern, I should never have come here. I understood it was fully equipped with every home comfort. There is no obligation for you to remain here if you're not completely satisfied, Mrs. Boyle. No, indeed. I should not think of doing so. Well, if there has been any misapprehension, it would perhaps be better if you went elsewhere. I could ring for the taxi to return. The roads are not yet blocked. We've had so many applications for rooms that I'm sure we should be able to fill yours quite easily. In any case, we are raising our terms next month. I shall certainly not leave before I have tried what the place is like. You needn't think that you can turn me out now. Perhaps you will take me up to my bedroom, Mrs. Ralston. Certainly, Mr. Boyle. Darling, you are wonderful. I think that's a perfectly horrible woman. I don't like her at all. I would love to see you turn her out into the snow. Serve her right. It's a pleasure, I'm afraid I've got, poor girl. <laughs> oh, there's another of them. Well, come in, come in. I'm in my car's barn for half a mile down the road. Run into a drift. Here, let me take this. Any more stuff in the car? No, I travel like. Uh, Mr. Wren, Miss... Kingswell. My wife will be down in a minute. No hurry. Got to get myself thawed out. That is, you've got a good fire. Weather forecast says heavy falls expected, motorist ward, etc. Hope you've got plenty of provisions in. No, oh, yes. My wife's an excellent manager. Anyway, we can always eat our hands. Before we start eating each other, eh? Uh, uh, any news in the paper, apart from the weather? Ah, uh, just a usual political crisis. We have some rather juicy murder. Murder? Oh, I like murder. You seem to think it was a homicidal maniac. Strangled a woman somewhere near our uh, Paddington. Sex maniac, I suppose. Hmm. Doesn't say very much, does it? The police are anxious to interview a man seen in the vicinity of Culver Street at the time. Medium height, wearing a darkish overcoat, lighter scarf, and soft felt hat. Police messages to this effect have been broadcast throughout the day. Useful description. Fit pretty well anyone, wouldn't it? Hmm. When the police say they're anxious to interview someone, isn't that a polite way of hinting that he's the murderer? Could be. Now, who was the woman who was murdered? Uh, it's Mrs. Lyon, Miss Maureen Lyon. Was she young or old? It, it doesn't say. It doesn't appear to have been a robbery. I told you. Sex mania. Oh, Miss Gates, well, this is my wife, Molly. How'd you do? How'd you do? It's an awful night. You wouldn't have charged me like a bar. You're right, I would. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
after all. It's like Mrs. Boyle that frightens me. As I said, we must have a nice dinner. I was thinking of opening two tins of minced beef and cereals, and then a tin of peas, and then there's stewed figs and custard for dessert. Do you think that should be all right? No, I should think so. Not, not very original, perhaps. Oh, do let me help. I simply adore cooking. Uh, why not an omelet? You've got eggs, haven't you? Plenty of them. Oh, and if you've got a bottle of cheap, any type wine, uh, we could add it to the uh, minced beef and cereals, did you say? Give it a continental flavor. Uh, show me where the kitchen is and what you've got, and I dare say I shall have an inspiration. This way. Thanks so much. Isn't he just the sweetest thing? He's put on an apron, got down all the spices, and told me not to come back for half an hour. Well, I guess we're going to do the cooking themselves. It will save us a lot of trouble. Why on earth did you give him the best room? I told you, we like the four-poster. And we like the pretty four Well, child. I have no use for that kind. You didn't have this baggage, I did. Had it got bricks in it? It had practically no weight at all. In fact, I believe there was nothing in it. It's probably one of those young men who go around bilking hotel keepers. I don't think so. I like him. I think that this case was rather peculiar, though. Terrible female. If she is a female. Anyway, I think that made your Metcalfs all right. Probably drink. Do you think so? No, I don't. I was just feeling rather depressed. Well, at any rate, we know the worst is over. They've all arrived. Who can that be? Probably the Culver Street murderer. Hello. 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 A thousand pardons. I am... Where am I? Uh, this is Monkswell Manor Guest House. But what stupendous good fortune. Madame, a guest house and a charming hostess. My Rolls Royce of that has run into a snowdrift. Blinding snow everywhere. I do not know where I am. Perhaps I think to myself, I shall freeze to death. And then I take little bag, I stagger through the snow, I see before me big iron gates. A habitation. I am saved. Twice I fall into the snow as I come up your drive. But at last, I arrive. And immediately, despair turns to joy. You can let me have a room. Yes? Oh, uh, yes. It's a rather small one, I'm afraid. See, we're only just starting. Charlie. Charlie. Oh, what about your luggage? That is of no consequence. I locked the car securely. Oh, but wouldn't it be better to get it in? No, no. I can assure you. On such a night as this, there will be no thieves abroad. And for me, my wants are simple. I have all I need. Here, this little bag. Yes, all I need. You'd better get thoroughly warm. I see about the room. I told you it's a rather small one, and cold too. You see, it faces the north side. Put on the other car. Yes, sir. Yes, there's Major Metcalf, Mrs. Boyle, young man called Christopher and Miss Casewell, and now you. Yes. The unexpected. The guest you did not invite. The guest who just arrived from out of the storm. It sounds quite dramatic, does it not? Who am I? Where am I from? You do not know. Me? I am a man of mystery. Now, I tell you this. I complete the picture. From now on, there will be no more arrivals. And no departures either. By tomorrow, perhaps even already, we are cut off from civilization. No butcher, no baker, no milkman, no postman, no daily papers, nobody, and nothing but ourselves. That is admirable. It could not suit my purposes better. My name, by the way, is Parapachi, Mr. and Mrs. Ralston. Yeah.
And this is Monswell Manor Guest House, you say? Good. Monkswell Manor Guest House. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Consider it most dishonest not to have told me they were just starting this place. Everything's got to have a beginning, you know. Excellent breakfast this morning. Good coffee, scrambled eggs, homemade marmalade. All very nicely served, too. The little woman does it all herself. Amateurs. There should be a proper start. Excellent lunch, too. Corn beef. I'm a very well disguised corn beef. Red wine in it. Mrs. Watson promised to bake us a pie tonight. These radiators are not hot. I shall speak about it. In very comfortable beds, too. At least mine was. I hope yours was as well. It was quite adequate. Really, I don't see why the best bedroom should have been given to that very peculiar young man. He's here ahead of us. First come, first serve. From the advertisement, I got quite a different picture of what this place would be like. A comfortable writing room. A much larger place altogether with bridge and other amenities. Regular old tabby's delight. I beg your pardon. Uh, I mean, yeah, quite see what you mean. No, indeed. I shan't stay here long. <laughs> no, no, I don't suppose you will. Really? What an extraordinary young man. Unbalanced mentally, I shouldn't wonder. He's escaped from a lunatic asylum. I shouldn't be at all surprised. I'll give you a hand, what? Good exercise, one must have exercise. What an extraordinary young woman. Doesn't she know anything about housework? Carrying a carpet sweeper through the front hall. Aren't there any back stairs? Oh yes, nice stairs. Very convenient if there was a fire. Then why not use them? Anyway, all of the housework should have been done this morning before lunch. I gather our hostess had to cook the lunch. All very haphazard and amateurish. There should be a proper start. Not very easy to get nowadays, is it? No, indeed. The lower classes seem to have no idea of their responsibilities. Poor old lower classes got a bit between their teeth, haven't they? I gather you are a socialist. Oh, I wouldn't say that. I'm not a red. Just pale pink. But I don't take much interest in politics. I live abroad. I suppose conditions are much easier abroad. I read the cooking clean as I gather most people have to do with this country. This country has gone sadly downhill. It's not what it used to be. I had to sell my house last year. Everything was just too difficult. Hotels and guest houses are easier. They certainly solve some of one's problems. Are you over in England for long? It depends. I've got some business to see to. When it's done, I shall go back. To France? No. Italy? No. Would you mind not playing that radio quite so loudly? I always find it rather distracting when I'm trying to write letters. Do you? If you don't particularly want to listen just Where's now... my favorite music? There's a writing table in there. I know, but it's much warmer in here. Much warmer, I agree. 
the best chair. I've got it now. You drove her out. I'm glad. I'm very glad. I don't like her a bit. Let's think of things we can do to annoy her, shall we? Oh, I wish she'd go away from here. In this, not a hope. Not possibly, but when the snow melts... When the snow melts, lots of things may have happened. Mm, yes, that's true. The snow's very beautiful, don't you think? It's so peaceful and pure. It makes one forget things. It does make me forget. Well, how fierce you sound. I was thinking. What sort of thinking? Ice on a bedroom jug. Frostbite raw and bleeding. One thin, ragged blanket. A child shivering with cold and fear. My dear, it sounds too, too grim. What is it, a novel? You didn't know I was a writer, did you? Are you? Sorry to disappoint you, actually, I'm not. I did remember to get a wireless license, didn't I? Yes, it's on the kitchen counter. I had rather near a shave with the car the other day, but it was entirely the other chap chap's fault. He must have done something. You no, know, probably having something to do with running this place. I expect we've ignored some tin pot regulation of some ministry or another. You, you practically can't avoid it nowadays. Wish we never started this place. Everyone is so cross. We're snowed up and going to a reserve of tea. Cheer up, darling. Everything's going all right at the moment. Well, I filled all the coal scuttles and brought in the wood and done the hens. I'll go and chop some kidney necks and... You know, come to think of it, there must have been something really ser serious to send a police sergeant tracking out on all this. It must be something really urgent. Ah, there you are, Mr. Walston. Do you know the central heating in the library is practically stone cold? Well, I'm sorry, Mrs. Boyle. We're a bit short on coal and... I am paying seven guineas a week here. Seven guineas. And I do not wish to freeze. I'll go and stoke it up. Mrs. Ralston, if you don't mind my saying so, it's a very extraordinary young man you are staying here. His manners and his ties. And does he ever brush his hair? He's an extremely brilliant young architect. I beg your pardon. Christopher Wren is an architect. My dear young woman, I have naturally heard of Sir Christopher Wren. Of course he was an architect. He built St. Paul's. You young people seem to think that no one is educated today but yourself. I meant this way. His name is Christopher. His parents called him that because they hoped he'd be an architect. And he is, or nearly one, so it turned out all right. <laughs> Sounds a fishy story to me. I should make some inquiries about him if I were you. What do you know of him? Just as much as I know about you, Mrs. Boyle. Is it, which is that you are both paying us seven guineas a week. That is really all I need to know and all that concerns me. It doesn't matter to me whether I like my guests or whether I don't. You are young and inexperienced, and you should welcome advice from someone more knowledgeable than yourself. And what about this foreigner? What about him? You weren't expecting him, were you? To turn away a bona fide traveler is against the law, Mrs. Boyle. You should know that. Why do you say that? Aren't you a magistrate? Sitting on the bench, Mrs. Boyle. All I say is that this Mr. Paravin... Paravincini, or whatever he calls himself, seems to me to be... Beware, dear lady. 
You speak of the devil, and there he is. I didn't hear you come in. I came in on tiptoe, like this. Nobody ever hears me if I do not want them to. I find that very amusing. Indeed. Now there was a young I lady. must get on with my letters. I'll see if it's a little warmer in the drawing room. My charming hostess looks upset. What is it, dear lady? Everything's rather difficult this morning because of the snow. Yes. Snow makes things very difficult. Or it makes them easy. Yes. Very easy. Do I know what you mean? Yes. I think there is quite a lot you do not know. For one thing, I think you know very little about running a guest house. Well, perhaps not, but we mean to make a go of it. Bravo. Bravo. I'm not such a very bad cook. You're without doubt an enchanting cook. May I give you a little word of warning, Mrs. Ralston? You and your husband must not be too trusting, you know. Have you any references with these guests of yours? Is that usual? We were some people just came. It is quite advisable to know a little about the people who sleep for, under your roof. Take, for example, myself. I turn up, saying that my car would turn in a snowdrift. What do you know of me? Nothing at all. I may be a thief. A robber. A fugitive from justice. A madman. Even... A murder. Oh. You see? And perhaps you know just a little of your other guests. But as far as Mrs. Boyle goes, the room is far too cold to sit in. I shall write my letters in here. Allow me to poke the fire for you. Mrs. Ralston, is your husband about? Pray, the pipes in the downstairs clerk room are quite frozen. Dear, what an awful day. It was the police, no? The police? Yes. There I am earlier to say there's any of it's or starting or something. I don't think I'll ever get here. The ruddy poles are more than half stones. And... Hello, is something the matter? The police are on their way. Why? Oh, that's all right. No one can get through in this. Well, the drifts must be five feet deep. The roads are blocked. But nobody can get here today. Excuse me, Mr. Farovich, you may put these down. Oh, oh there it is. Are you Mr. Ralston? Yes. Detective Sergeant Charlotte, Berkshire Police. Can I get these keys off and stow them somewhere? Uh, sure. Go around the front. We'll, I'll let you in. I suppose that's what we pay our police force for nowadays. To go around enjoying themselves at winter sports. Why did you send for the police, Mrs. Ralston? I didn't. Who's that man? Where did he come from? He passed by the drawing room window on skis all over the snow, looking terribly hearty. You may believe it or not. But that man is a policeman. A policeman skiing. Uh, this is Detective Sergeant Trump. Good afternoon. You can't be a sergeant. You're too young. I'm not quite so young as I look, madam. Oh, but terribly hearty. Uh, we'll stow your skis away under the stairs this way, please. Thank you. He's very attractive, don't you think so? No great. Can you have fun? Certainly, Major. Well, that would last. I always thought the police were very attractive. Mrs. Ralston, the lion is dead. Quite dead. It was all right, half an hour ago. I suppose it's gone away to the snow. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're cut off. Quite cut off. That's funny, isn't it? <laughs> Don't see anything to laugh at. No, indeed. Ah, it's a private joke of my own. His sleuth is returning. Now we can get down to business, Mr. Ralston, Mrs. Ralston. Do you want to see some private so we can go in the library? No, it's not necessary. It'll save time if everyone's present. If I might sit at this table. I bet you your chair. Thank you. Please hurry up and tell us what have we done? Done? Oh, no, Mrs. Ralston, it's nothing of that kind. It's more a matter of police protection, if you understand me. Police protection? Yes, it relates to the death of Mrs. Maureen Lyon of 24 Carver Street, London, West 2.
who was murdered yesterday, the 15th instant. You may have heard or read about the case. Yes, I heard it on the radio, the woman who was strangled. That's right, madam. Now, the first thing I want to know is if you were in any way acquainted with this Mrs. Lyon. Never heard of her. You may have known her under the name of Lyon. Lyon wasn't her real name. She had a police record, and her fingerprints were on file, so we were able to identify her without difficulty. Her real name was Maureen Stanning. Her husband was John Stanning, a farmer who resided at Longridge Farm, not very far from here. Longridge Farm? Wasn't that where those children were? Yes, the Longridge Farm case. Three children. That's right, miss. The Corrigans. Two boys and a girl. Brought before the court as in need of care and protection. Home was found for them with Mr. and Mrs. Stanning at Longridge Farm. One of the children subsequently died from criminal neglect and persistent ill treatment. The case made a bit of a sensation at the time. It was horrid. The Stanning were sentenced to terms of imprisonment. Stanning died in prison. Mrs. Stanning served her sentence and was duly released. And yesterday, as I say, she was found strangled at 24 Calvert Street. Who did it? I'm coming to that, madam. A notebook was picked up near the scene of a crime. In it were two addresses. One was 24 Calvert Street, and the other was Monkswell Manor. What? Yes, sir. That's why Superintendent Hogman, on receiving this information from Scotland Yard, thought it imperative for me to come out here and to find out if there was any connection between this household or anyone in this house in the Longridge Farm case. No, no connection. There must have been a coincidence. Superintendent Ogden doesn't think it's a coincidence, sir. He'd have come here himself if it had been in any way possible. But under the weather conditions, and as I can ski, he sent me to come here with instructions to get full particulars of everyone in the house, <coughs> to report back to me by phone, and to take whatever measures I saw fit to ensure the safety of this household. Safety? What, what kind of danger is it in Good Lord, he's not suggesting somebody's going to be killed here. I don't want to frighten any of the ladies, but frankly, yes, that's the idea. But why? That's what I've got to find out. Oh, but it's just fantastic. Yes, sir, it's because it's fantastic that it makes it dangerous. Nonsense. It all seems a bit far-fetched to me. I think it's wonderful. Is there something you're not telling us? Yes, Mrs. Ralston. Below the two addresses was written three blind mice. And on the dead woman's body, a paper was found with the words, this is the first written on it. Below the words was a bar of music and a drawing of three little mice. The music was the tune of the nursery rhyme, Three Blind Mice. You all know how it goes. Three blind mice, three blind mice, see how they run. It's possible. Uh, there were three children and one died. Yes, the youngest, the boy of eleven. What happened to the other two? The sister was adopted by someone. We haven't been able to trace her present whereabouts. The other boy would now be about 22. Deserted from the army. And hasn't been heard of since. And according to the psychologist's report, definitely schizophrenic. A bit queer in the head, that's to say. Well, I think it was he who killed Mrs. N Mrs. Stanley. Yes. And that he's a homicidal maniac, and he'll come here and try and kill one of us. Why? That's what I've got to find out from you. As the superintendent sees it, there must be some connection. Now you state, sir, that you yourself have never had any connection with this Longridge farm. No. <clears throat> and the same goes for you, madam? No. No, no, I mean no connection. I see. Excuse me, Sergeant, I really must finish the dinner. I'll be in the kitchen if you need me. That's quite all right, Mrs. Ralston. Now, can I have all your names, please? This is quite ridiculous. We are merely staying in a type of hotel, and we only arrived here yesterday. We have nothing to do with this place. But you plan to come here ahead, though. You booked your rooms earlier. Oh, yes. All except for Mr. Haramichi. My car over turned in snowdrifts. I see. What I'm getting at is that anyone who's been following you around might know very well that you are planning on coming here. Now there's just one thing I want to know, and I want to know it quick. Which of you is it that has some connection with that business at Longridge Farm? You're not being very sensible, you know. One of you's in danger. 
deadly danger. And as of right now, I don't know which of you that is. All right then, I'll ask you one by one. Uh, you first, since you seem to have arrived here more or less by accident, Mr. Parry. Para. Para the chief. My dear sergeant, I know nothing but nothing of what you've been talking about. I am a stranger in this country. And I know nothing of these local affairs of bygone years. I see. You, Mrs. Boyle. I don't see. Really, I consider it an impertinence. Why should I have anything to do with such distressing business? And you, miss? Casewell, Leslie Casewell. I never heard of Longridge Farm, and I have nothing to do with it. <clears throat> and you, sir? Major, Major. I read about it in the papers at the Times. I was stationed at Edinburgh then. No personal knowledge. And you? Uh, Christopher Wren. I was a mere child at the time. I don't remember even hearing about it. That's all you have to say, any of you. Well, if one of you gets murdered, you'll have yourselves to blame. Mr. Alston, may I take a look around the house, please? Sir. Thank you. My dear, so very melodramatic. He's very attractive, don't you think so? I always thought the police were very attractive. So standard, hard boiled. Quite a thrill, this whole business. Three blind mice. Now, how did that go again? Mm -hmm. Really, Mr. Wren? Don't you like it? Oh, but it's a signature to me. The signature of a murder. Melodramatic rubbish. I don't believe a word of it. Oh, but just wait, Mrs. Boyle, till I creep up behind you and you feel my hands on your throat. Stop! Christopher, it's a very poor joke. In fact, it's no joke at all. Ah, oh, but it is. That's just what it is. A madman's joke. That's just what makes it so deliciously macabre. Oh, if you could just see your faces. A singularly ill-mannered and neurotic young man. Where's Giles? He's taking up policemen on a conducted tour of the house. Your friend, the architect, has been behaving in a most abnormal manner. Young fellows seem very nervy nowadays. And here, get over it. Nerves. I have no patience for people who say they have nerves. I haven't any nerves. Perhaps that's just as well for you, Mrs. Boyle. What do you mean? I believe you were a magistrate at the time. In fact, I believe you were responsible for sending those children to Longridge Farm. Really, Major Metcalf, I can hardly be held responsible. We had reports from welfare workers. The farm people seemed very nice and were really most anxious to have the children. It seemed most satisfactory. There were fresh eggs, fresh milk, and a healthy out of doors life. Kicks and blows and starvation and a fairly vicious couple. But how was I to know? They seemed very civil. They were very civilly spoken. I was right, it was. One tries to do a public duty and all one gets is abuse. <laughs> you must forgive me, but I'm enjoying myself greatly. Please excuse me. I never did like that man. Where did he come from last night? Don't know. Looks a bit of a spit to me. Where's rouge and makeup, too? Disgusting. He seems quite old, too. Skips about as though I were young. You only want some more wood. I'll get it. It's almost dark and it's only four o'clock. Turn the lights on. Now, uh, where did I leave my pen? Thank mm -hmm. you. 
They say what happens to you when you're a child matters more than anything else. They say? They say who says? Psychologists. It's all humbug, the whole thing. I've been with psychologists and psychiatrists. I've never had much to do with it. Lucky for you, you have it. It's all about who the whole thing. Life's what you make of it. Go straight ahead and don't look back. One can't always help looking back. Nonsense. It's all a question of willpower. I suppose. I know. Yes, but... Sometimes things happen to make you remember. Don't give in. Turn your back on them. Is that really the right way? I wonder. Perhaps that's all wrong. Perhaps one really ought to face them. It depends on what you're talking about. Sometimes I hardly know what I am talking about. No. Nothing from the past is going to affect me, except in the way I want it to. Well, everything was, seems all right upstairs. What's in here, drawing room? Would you mind closing that door? Well, that completes the tour. I think I'll make my report to Superintendent Hawkin now. Oh, you can't tell from the lines. What? Since when? Major Betcalf tried it earlier. But it was all right earlier. Superintendent Hawkin got through. Yes, I suppose it must be down with the snow now. I wonder. It may have been cut. Cut? But who would have cut it? Mr. Alston, just how much do you know about these people that are staying in your guest house? I, we really don't know very much. I see. Mrs. Boyle wrote from a Bournemouth hotel, and Major Metcalf from an address in, where was it? Uh, Leamington. Leamington. Wren wrote from Hampstead, and the caseful woman from a private hotel in Kensington. Well, Paravicini, as we told you, arrived out of the blue last night. Still, I suppose they've all got rational books, that sort of thing. Yes, I shall go into all that. There's not much reliance to be placed in that sort of evidence. Go. You've got a description of what this man looked like in London? Yes, Mrs. Ralston. Medium height, indeterminate build, darkish overcoat, light scarf, and soft felt hat. And the kettle whispered. There are three darkish overcoats in the closet, Mr. Ralston. One of them is yours. There are three lightish felt hats. I still can't believe it. It's this telephone wire that worries me. If it's been cut... Excuse me, Sergeant, I really must go. Mr. Alston, is there an extension? Mr. Ralston? I beg your pardon, did you say something? Yes, sir. I said, is there an extension? Uh, yes, up in our bedroom. Go up there and try it for me, will you?
think Mrs. Ralston. Try and think. Take up, quick. My head's gone. Mrs. Boyle had just been killed when you got to her. Are you sure you didn't hear or see anybody as you came along the hallway? No, I don't think so. Just the radio blaring out loud. I couldn't think we turned it on so loud. I wouldn't hear anything else without that, would I? It was clearly the murderer's idea. Or murderess. How could I hear anything else? You might have done. If the murderer had left the hall that way, he might have heard you come from the kitchen, might have slipped into the cupboard, or up the back stairs. I think... I'm not sure. Maybe just as I came in, I heard a door creak. Which door? I don't know. Come on, Mrs. Ralston, try and think. Which door? Left, right, close at hand? I don't know, I tell you. I'm not even trying at anything at all. Can't you stop putting her? Can't you see she's all in? We're investigating a murder, Mr. Ralston. Up till now, no one has taken this thing seriously. Mrs. Boyle didn't. She held out on me. You all held out on me. Well, Mrs. Boyle is dead. And unless we get to the bottom of this, and quickly, mind, there's going to be another death. Another? Here? Yeah, why? Because, Mr. Ralston, there were three little blind mice. There were death for each of them? But there would have to be another connection with the Long Ridge Farm. Yes, there would have to be that. But I, I just, I just can't believe it. That's nonsense. Surely it would be a most unlikely coincidence that two people should arrive here by chance. Both of them with a share in the Norwich Farm case? Given certain circumstances, Miss Casewell, it wouldn't be so much of a coincidence. Think it out. Now, I want to get down quite clearly where everyone was when, at the time, Mrs. Boyle was killed. I already have Mrs. Ralston's statement. You were in the kitchen preparing vegetables. You came out of the kitchen, along through the hall, through the swinging door, in, along the passageway, and then in here. The radio was blaring, but the light was switched off and the hall was dark. You crossed and over to the radio, turned it off, switched on the light, saw Mrs. Boyle and screamed. Yes. Yes, I screamed, and finally people came. Yes, people came. As you say, a lot of people. All arriving from different directions, coming more or less at once. Now then, when I got out of this window to trace the telephone wire, you, Mr. Ralston, went upstairs to the bedroom that you and your wife occupied to trace the telephone extension there. Where were you when Mrs. Ralston screamed? I was set up in the bedroom. The line was dead there, too. I looked out of the window to see if I could see any sign of the wires being cut out there, but I couldn't. Well, just after I shut the window, I heard Molly scream, and I rushed down here. Those simple actions took you a rather long time, didn't they? I don't think so. I should say you definitely took your time. I was thinking of something. Very well, then. Now, Mr. Wren, I'll have your account of where you were. Uh, I've been in the kitchen. I see what I could do to help Mrs. Ralston. I adore cooking. Afterwards, I'd go upstairs to my bedroom. Why? Well, it's a perfectly natural thing to do, don't you think? I mean, one does want to be alone sometimes. You wanted to go up to your bedroom because you wanted to be alone. And I wanted to, uh, to brush my hair and uh, tidy up. You wanted to brush your hair? Anyway, that's where I was. And then you heard Mrs. Ralston scream. Yes. And you came down. Yes. Curious that you and Mr. Ralston didn't meet on the stairs. I came down by the back stairs. They're nearer to my room. Did you go up by the back stairs or did you come through here? I went up by the back stairs as well. See. Mr. Paravicini. I have told you. I was playing the piano in the drawing room. Through there, Inspector. I'm not an inspector, just a sergeant. Did anyone hear you playing the piano? I do not expect so. I was playing very, very softly. With one finger. Like so. You were playing three blind mice. Is that so? Yes. It's very catchy little tune. It is, how shall I say it, a haunting little tune? Don't you all agree? I think it's horrid. And yet, it runs in people's minds. Someone was whistling it too. Whistling it where? I do not know. Perhaps in the front hall, perhaps on the stairs, perhaps even upstairs in the bedroom. Who was whistling three blind mice? Are you making this up, Mr. Paravicini? No, no, Inspector. I beg your pardon. Sergeant. I would not do a thing like that. 
Mr. Ralston upstairs, Mrs. Ralston in the kitchen, Mr. Wren upstairs, Mr. Palavicini in the drawing room, Miss Casewell. I was writing letters in the library. Could you hear what was going on in here? No, I didn't hear anything until Mrs. Ralston screamed. And then you came in here? Yes. You say you were writing letters. Curious that there doesn't seem to be any unfinished letter on the writing desk. I brought it with me. Dearest Jesse, friend or relation. It's none of your damned business. Perhaps not. You know this case well. If I were to hear someone screaming blue murder when I was writing letters, I don't think I'd take the time to pick up my unfinished letter, fold it, and put it in my pocket before seeing what was the matter. You wouldn't? How interesting. Now then, Major Metcalf, you've told us you were in the cellars. Why? Looking around, just looking around. I was in the cupboard underneath the stairs near the kitchen. That's a sports tackle and junk, and I noticed there was another door behind it. I was curious, so I went down. Nice cellars you've got. How'd you like them? Not at all. It's a crypt of an old monastery, I should say. Probably why the place is called Monkswell. We're not engaged in antiquarian research, Major. We're investigating a murder. Mrs. Ralston has told us that she had a door shut with a faint creak. That particular door shuts with a creak. It could be, you know, that after killing Mrs. Boyle, the murderer stuck through, out through the passageway and into the cupboard, pulling the door to after him. A lot of things could be, Sergeant. Uh, there'd be fingerprints on the inside of the cupboard. Well, mine are all right, but most criminals are careful to wear gloves, aren't they? It's usual, but all criminals slip up sooner or later. Now, I wonder, Sergeant. That's really true. Look here, Sergeant, are we just waiting Mr. Ralston! I am in charge of this investigation. Very well. Mr. Ralston! Thank you. Now, we've got to establish opportunity you know as well as motive. And let me tell you this. You all had opportunity. There are two staircases. Anyone could go up by one and come down by another. Anyone could go down to the cellars by the cupboard door near the kitchen and come up by a flight of stairs that leads up through a trap door near to the foot of the stairs over here. The vital fact was that every one of you was alone at the time the murder was committed. But look here, Sergeant, you speak as though we're all under suspicion. That's absurd. In a murder case, everyone is under suspicion. Yes, but you know pretty well who killed the woman. You think it's the eldest of those three children at the farm. A mentally abnormal young man, about 23 years of age. Well, damn it, there's only one person who fits the bill. That's not true. That's not true! You're all against me. Everyone's always been against me. You're going to frame me for a murder. It's persecution. That's what it is. It's persecution. It's all right. Chris, no one's against you. Tell him it's all right. But we don't frame people. And if you're not going to arrest him. I'm not going to arrest anyone. To do that, I must have evidence. And I haven't any. Yet. Now, you're crazy. And you too. There's only one person who fits the bill. And if only the safety measure, he ought to be put under arrest. It's only fair to the rest of us. No, no. Sergeant, try to make speak to you a bit. Certainly, Mrs. Ralston. Will the rest of you go into the dining room, please? Please. I'm staying. I don't know what's come over. Please, James. Yes, Mrs. Ralston. What is it you want to say to me? Sergeant Tron, you think that this killer must be the oldest of the three children at the farm. But you don't know that, do you? We don't actually know a thing. All we've got so far is that the woman who joined with her husband in ill-treating and starving those children has been killed. And that the woman magistrate responsible for placing them there has been killed. The telephone line that connects me with police headquarters has been cut. You don't know that. Might just be down with the snow. Oh no, Mrs. Ralston. The line was deliberately cut. I found the place just outside the front door. I see. Sit down, Mrs. Ralston. 
Still, all the same, you don't know. I'm going by probability. It all points one way. Mental instability, childish mentality, desertion from the army, and the psychiatrist. I know, before. and therefore it all seems to point to Christopher. But I don't believe it is me. There must be other possibilities. Such as? I had those children had any relations at all? The mother was a drunk. She died soon after the children were taken away from her. What about their father? A retired army sergeant. Probably, if he's alive, he's probably been discharged from the army by now. You don't know where he is now? To trace it may take some time. But I can assure you, Mrs. Ralston, that the police take every eventuality into account. Yes, but you don't know where he is now. And if the son is unstable, isn't it possible the father might have been as well? That's a possibility. Well, yes, but... Suppose he come home after being a prisoner of war, perhaps, after having suffered terribly, mind. He comes home, and he found his wife dead and his children gone, and then one of them goes through some horrid experience and dies through it. He might go off his head a bit and want revenge. That's only surmise. Oh, yes, but it's possible. Oh, yes, Mrs. Ralston. It's quite possible. So, the killer might be middle-aged or even old. <coughs> When I said the poli police had rung up, Major Metcalf got frightfully upset. He really was. I saw his face. Major Metcalf? Middle-aged. A soldier. I know he seems quite nice and normal, but it mightn't show, might it? No, Mrs. Ralston. It often doesn't show at all. So? It's not only Christopher's a suspect, but Major Metcalf as well. Any other suggestions? Well, Mr. Paravicini got the poker. When I said the police drummer. Mr. Paravicini. And I know he seems quite old. Foreign and everything. But he moves like a much younger man, and he wears makeup on his face. Miss Kate got noticed it too. He might be, I know, I know this sounds very melodramatic, but he might be disguised. Mrs. Ralston, you're very anxious, aren't you, that it shouldn't be young Mr. Wren? seems so helpless. Let me, tell you, let me tell you something, Mrs. Ralston. I've had every possibility in mind ever since the beginning. There was the son, Georgie, and the father, and there was someone else. The sister, you remember. The sister? <coughs> yes, it might have been a woman who killed Mrs. Lyon. A, a woman. The man's felt hat pulled down and the muffler pulled well up. And the killer whispered. It's the voice that gives the sex away, you know. Oh, yes, it might have been a woman. Miss Casewell? She seems a bit old for the part. Oh, yes, there's a very wide field. There's yourself, for instance. Me? <coughs> You're about the right age. No, whatever you have to tell me, I'm not at liberty to check it at the present moment. There's also your husband, Mr. Giles. Don't be ridiculous. How long had you known Giles Ralston before you... How much do you know about your husband, Mrs. Ralston? Do you know he and Christopher Wren are much of an age? <coughs> Say, your husband looks older than his years? And Christopher Wren looks younger. Actual age is very hard to tell. How much do you know about your husband, Mrs. Ralston? How much do I know about Giles? Don't be ridiculous. How long have you been married? Just a year. And you met him where? At a dance in London. We went to a party. Did you meet his people? He hasn't any people. They're all dead. They're all dead? Yes. You make it sound all wrong. His father was a barrister and his mother died when he was a baby. You're only telling me what he told you. Well, yes, but... You know, Mrs. Ralston, you'd be surprised rather how many cases rather like yours we get. Especially since the war. Homes broken up, families dead. No backgrounds. A fellow says he's just finished his army training or just come out of the Air Force. There aren't any backgrounds anymore, Mrs. Ralston. There aren't any relatives. 
It's the parents and relatives that used to make the inquiries before they consented to an engagement. But that's all done away with now. The girl just marries her man. She doesn't find out for a year or two that he may be an absconding bank clerk, or an army deserter, or something equally undesirable. How long did you know Giles Ralston before you married him? Just three weeks. But... And you don't know anything about him? It's not true. I know everything about him. I know exactly the sort of person he is. He's Giles, and it's absolutely absurd to suggest he's some crazy homicidal maniac. He wasn't even in London yesterday. Where was he? Here? No. He went cross country to get some wine and eat fried chickens. Pick it up with him? Bring it home? No, it turned out to be the wrong kind. Hmm. You're only 30 miles from London, aren't you? Oh, I see you have a schedule. <laughs> only an hour by train. A little longer by car. Oh, Giles was it in London. Just a minute, Mrs. Ralston. This is your husband's coat? Yes. London Times. Yesterday. Sold on the streets about 3.30 yesterday afternoon. Don't believe it. Don't you? Don't you? Well, you startled me. Where is he? Where is he gone? Who? The sergeant. Went out that way. Thought I could get away. Somehow, somewhere. Is there somewhere I can hide? In the house? Hide? It's from him. Why? The darlings are all so frightfully against me. They're going to say I committed these murders, particularly your husband. Don't worry about him. Listen, Chris, well, you can't go on running away from things all your life. Why do you say that? It's true, isn't it? Yes, it's quite true. Got to grow up sometime, Chris. I wish I had one. Your name isn't really Christopher Wren, is it? No. And you're not really training to be an architect, are you? No. Why did you... Call myself Christopher Wren? It just amused me. Then he used to make jokes. Call me little Christopher Robin. Robin, Wren, Association of Ideas. It was hell being at school. What's your real name? And we needn't go into that. I ran away whilst I was doing my army service. It was all so beastly. I hated it. Yes, I'm just like the unknown matter. I told you I was the one the specification fitted. But you see. My mother. My mother. Yes, your mother. I think it would be all right if she hadn't died. She would have taken care of me and looked after me. You can't go on being looked after all your life. Things happen to you, they change you. You've got to go on just as usual. One can't do that. Yes, one can. You mean, you have? Yes. What was it? Something very bad? Something I've never forgotten. Was it to do with Giles? No, it was long before I met Giles. You must have been very young. Almost a child. Perhaps that's why it was so awful. But I try never to think about it. I try to put it out of my mind. So you're running away from things too? Running away instead of facing them. Yes, I suppose the way I am. You know, considering I never saw you two yesterday, we seem to know quite a bit about each other. Yes, it's, it's odd, isn't it? I don't know. There's a sort of sympathy between us. Anyway, you you think I ought to stick it out? Frankly, what else can you do? I, I can finish the size of skis. I can ski quite well. No, that'd be frightfully stupid. But like admitting you're guilty. Sergeant Charlotte thinks I'm guilty. No, he doesn't. At least... 
Oh, I don't know what he thinks. I hate him. I hate him. Who? Sergeant Trotter. He puts things into your head, things that aren't true, things that can't be true. What is all this? I don't believe it. I don't believe it. What won't you believe? Come on, out with it. You see this? Yes. What is it? Yesterday in London town. Found a girl's coat pocket. Charles said he wasn't in London yesterday. Well, if he was here all day. But he wasn't. He went back to get some wine heading for our chickens, but he couldn't find any. Well, that's all right. Possibly he did go to London after all. Why should he tell me? Did my potato been running all around the countryside? Perhaps with news of this murder. Charles didn't know about the murder then. Or did he? Did he? Oh, good Lord, Marla. Shelley, you don't think. Oh, well, the sergeant doesn't think. I don't think. know what the sergeant thinks. But he'll make me think he's about other people. You ask yourself questions and you start to doubt. Feel that someone you love no one might just turn out to be a stranger. What happens in a nightmare? You're somewhere. In the middle of friends. Turn around, draw their faces. They're not your friends any longer. They're different people, just pretending. But you can't trust anybody then. Perhaps everybody is a stranger. I seem to be interrupting something. I was just going out to the kitchen to finish the things. Well, I'll give you a hand. No, you won't. Giles. Tete and tete aren't very healthy things at the present. You keep out of the kitchen and keep away from my wife. Oh, really? You keep away from my wife, and she's not going to be the next victim. So that's what you think about me. I've already said so, haven't I? There seems to be a killer loose in this house, and it seems to me you're the only one who fits the bill. I'm not the only one who fits the bill. I don't see who else does. How blind are you? Or do you just pretend to be blind? I tell you, I'm worrying about my wife's safety. So am I. I'm not going to be here alone with her. What the hell is this? Please go, Chris. I'm not going. Please go, Chris. I need it. I shot be far away. Molly, what is all this? Better to leave a pet and shut yourself up in the kitchen with a homicidal mania. He is. You've only got to look at him to see he's a lunatic. He is. He isn't dangerous. I know if you were. Just too heavy. Anyway, I can look after myself. That's what Mrs. Boyle said. Don't. Look, what's between you and that wretched boy? What do you mean by between us? Perhaps you've met him before. Perhaps you suggested for him to come here and that you both meet for the first time. All cooked up between you, was it? Now, you're crazy. How dare you make these accusations? Rather odd, isn't it, that you should come and stay at an out-of-the-way place like this? No odd, isn't it? Miss Case were hoping to make care for Mrs. Boyle, sir. I read once in the paper that these homicidal cases were able to attract women. Looks as if it were true. Where did you first meet him? How long has this been going on? I never said I liked Christopher Ray before yesterday. No, you haven't. Perhaps you've been running up to meet him in London on the slide. You know perfectly well I haven't been up to London for weeks. No, you haven't been to London for weeks. Is that so? What are you talking about? It's quite true. Is it? Then what's this? This is one of the gloves you were wearing yesterday. You dropped it. I picked it up this afternoon while I was speaking to Sergeant Trotter. You see what's inside it? A London bus ticket. That. So it seems you not only went to the village yesterday, you went to London as well. All right. I went to London. Whilst I was safely racing around the countryside. Whilst you were racing around the countryside? Come on now, admit it. You went to London. All right, I went to London. So did you. What? So did you. Brought back an evening paper. Where'd you get hold of that? Your overcoat. Oh, anybody could have put it there. They didn't, did they? No, you went to London. It's all right, I went to London. But I didn't go to meet a woman there. Didn't you? Are you sure you didn't talk? You can be a me. What's the matter? Don't touch did me. Did you go to London to meet Christopher Ray Don't be a fool, of course I did. Then why did you go? I shall tell you. Now, I forgot why I went. Molly, what is those things? Uh, I feel as though I don't know you anymore. Perhaps you never did know me. How long have we been married? Just a year. But you don't know anything about me. What I thought, felt, or suffered before you knew me. Molly, you're crazy. All right, then, I'm crazy. Perhaps 
Perhaps it's fun to be crazy. What are you talking about? Oh, Molly, come on. I do hope the youngsters are not saying a bit more than you mean. One is so apt to these lovers' quarrels. Lovers' quarrels, that's a good one. Quite so, quite so. I know just how you feel. I've been through all this when I was a younger man. Jeunesse, jeunesse, as the poet says. Not been married long, I imagine. That's no business of yours, Mr. Paravicini. No, no. No business at all. I just came down to see that the sergeant cannot find his skis. What? And I'm afraid he's very... Christopher, he wants to know if you by any chance move them, Mr. Ralston. No, of course not. Mr. Ralston, Mrs. Ralston, have either of you two removed a pair of my pair of skis back from the cupboard where we put them? Certainly not. Somebody's taken them. Whatever made you happen to look for them? The snow is still lying. I need reinforcements. I was going to ski over the police station at Market Hampton and report on this situation. And now you shan't. Dear, dear, somebody certainly seen to it that you shan't do that. But there could be another reason, couldn't there? Yes, what? Somebody may want to get away. What did you mean when you said Christopher just now? Uh, so our young architect has hooked it, has he? Ha, ha, ha. Very, very interesting. Is this true, Mrs. Ralston? Uh, oh, thank goodness you had it, Paul. Mr. Wren, have you removed my skis? Your skis, Sergeant? No, why should I? Well, Mrs. Ralston seemed to Hello, think... Hello, Sergeant. Mr. Wren is very fond of skiing. I thought perhaps he'd take them up for a bit of exercise. Yeah, exercise, indeed. Listen, people, this is a serious matter. Someone has removed my only means of communication with the outside world. I want everyone assembled here at once. I think Miss Casewell has gone upstairs. I'll get him. I left Major Metcalf in the dining room. Major Metcalf? He's not there now. I'll try and find him. No, what do you mean? It's a question of my skis. Skis? Have either of you two removed my skis back from the cover there? Oh, Lord, no. Why should I? Well, I didn't touch them. Nevertheless, they are gone. Which way did you go to your room? By the back stairs. Then you passed by that cupboard door. If you say so, I've no idea where your skis are. You were actually in that cupboard today. Yes. At the time Mrs. Boyle was killed. The time Mrs. Boyle was killed, I've gone down to the cellars. Did you notice the skis there when you passed through? I haven't the faintest idea. Did you see them there? I can't remember. You must remember if those skis were there then. Now you're shouting, young fellow. I wasn't interested in your damn skis. The architecture of this place is very interesting. I went down to the cells to take a look at them. Not your, I can't tell you with your skis or they are not. Well, I suppose you ought to be able to find them, you said, too. Now, in case you want to dimble, you whack them great things, skis. I suppose we all said, too. Not quite so fast, Major Metcalf. That may be, you know, what we are meant to do. Don't follow you, Sergeant. I'm in the position now where I've got to put myself in the place of a crazy, cunning brain. I've got to decide what he wants us to do and what he himself is planning to do next. Because if I don't, if I don't stay just one step ahead of him, there's going to be another death. Surely you still don't believe that. Yes, Miss Case, well, I do. Three blind mice, two mice cancelled out, a third mouse still to be dealt with. There are six of you listening to me right now. One of you is a killer. One of you is a killer. I don't know which yet, but I shall. Another view is the killer's prospective victim. That's the person I'm speaking to. Mrs. Boyle held out for me. Well, Mrs. Boyle is dead. You, whoever you are, are holding out on me. Don't. Because you're in danger. Anyone who's killed twice is not going to hesitate to kill a third time. And as it is, I don't know which of you that needs protection the most. Come on now. Anyone who has anything, however slight, to reproach themselves for in that bygone business had best come out with it now.
All right, you won't. Oh, I'll get the killer. Of that, I'm sure. But it may be too late for one of you. Let me tell you something else. The killer's enjoying himself. Oh, yes. He's enjoying himself a great deal. All right, you can go. Just touch the fresh Susan of mustard. I'll come to the kitchen with you. We will see what we can concoct. I'm helping my wife, Caravacci. Your husband is afraid for you. Quite natural under the circumstances. He doesn't fancy your being alone. It is my sadistic tendencies he fears, not my dishonorable ones. Alas, what an inconvenience the husband always is. Certainly, doesn't think. He is very wise. Take no chances. Can I prove to you, or to your husband, or to our dog it's Sergeant, that I am not a homicidal maniac? Then, suppose that I am, really. Mm -hmm. Oh, stop! Such a catchy little tune, don't you think? She cut out their tails with a carving knife. Snick, snick. Snick. Delicious. Just what a child would adore. Cruel things, children. <laughs> Some of us never grow up. You stop frightening my wife at once. I knew it's silly of me. See, I found her. I know. It's difficult to forget things. You aren't really the forgetting kind. You must go. What did you say to the lady to upset her, sir? Me, Sergeant? Oh, just a little innocent fun. I've always been fond of a little jet. There is nice fun. And then there is fun that is not so nice. Now, I do wonder what you mean by that, Sergeant. I've been doing some wondering about you, too. Indeed. I've been wondering about that car of yours. And how it happened to overturn in the snow. So conveniently. Inconveniently, don't you mean, Sergeant? That rather depends on the way you're looking at it. Just where were you bound for, by the way, when you had this accident? I was on my way to see a friend. In this neighborhood? Not so very far from here. What was the address and name of this friend? Now, really, Sergeant, does that matter now? I mean, it has nothing to do with this predicament we're in. But we always like the fullest information. Now, what did you say this friend's name was? I didn't say. No, you didn't say. And it looks like you're not going to say. But there might be so many reasons. An amour, discretion, these jealous husbands. Rather old to be running around with the ladies at your time of life, aren't you? My dear sergeant, I'm not perhaps quite so old as I look. That's just what I've been thinking, sir. What? That you may not be as old as you try to look. Many people go around trying to look younger than they are. If a person goes about trying to look older, well, it does make one ask oneself why. Having asked so many questions. You ask questions of other people as well? Isn't that overdoing things? I might get an answer from myself. I certainly don't get many from you. Well, well, try again. That is, if you have any more questions to ask. One or two. Where were you coming from last night? That is simple, from London. What address in London? I always stay at the Ritz Hotel. Very nice too, I'm sure. What is your permanent address? I dislike permanency. What is your business or profession? I play the market. Stockbroker? No, no, you misunderstand me. 
enjoying this little game, aren't you? Sure of yourself, too. Well, I shouldn't be too sure, because you're mixed up in a murder case, and don't you forget it. Murder isn't just fun and games. Not even this murder. <laughs> Dear me, Sergeant Trotter, you're so serious. I always thought the policeman had no sense of humor. Is the Inquisition over now, for the moment? For the moment, yes. Thank you so much. I shall go to the piano in the drawing room. Look for your skis, just in case anybody's hidden them in the grand piano. Just a minute, please. Were you speaking to me? Yes. Perhaps you'd come and sit down. Well, what do you want? You may have heard some of the questions I was asking. I heard them. I'd like some information from you. What do you want to know? Full name, please. Leslie Margaret Catherine Casewell. Catherine? I spell it with a K. Uh, quite so. Address? Via Mariposa Pindor, Mallorca. Now that's in Italy. It's an island. A Spanish island. I see. And your address in England? Care of Morgan's Bank, Leadenhall Street. No other English address? No. How long have you been in England? A week. And you've been staying since your arrival? At the Ledbury Hotel, Knightsbridge. What brought you to Monkswell Manor, Miss Casewell? I, I wanted somewhere quiet, in the country. How long did you, or do you, propose to remain here? Until I finished what I came here to do. And what was that? And what was that? I, I beg your pardon, I was thinking of something else. I said, what was it you came here to do? I really don't see, you know, why I should answer you. It's a strictly private affair. A matter that concerns me alone. All the same, Miss Case. No, I don't think we'll argue about it. Would you mind if I asked you how your age? Not in the least. 24. It's on my passport. 24? You were thinking I looked older? That is quite true. Is there anyone in this country who can vouch for you? My back can reassure you uh, as to my financial position. And I can refer you to a solicitor, a very discreet man. I'm not in a position to offer you a social reference, as I live most of my life abroad. In Mallorca? In Mallorca and other places. You know, Miss Casewell, I can't quite make you out. Does it matter? I don't know. What are you doing here? It seems to worry you. It does worry me. You went abroad when you were 13. 12, 13 thereabouts. Was your name Casewell then? It's my name now. What was your name then? Come on, tell me. What are you trying to prove? I want to know what your name was when you left England. It was a long time ago. I've forgotten. There are things one doesn't forget. Possibly. Unhappiness? Despair? I dare say. Come on, what's your real name? I told you. Leslie Margaret Catherine Casewell. Catherine? What the hell are you doing here? I... God, I wish to God I'd never come here. I always thought the police weren't allowed to give people the third degree. I've merely been interrogating Miss Casewell. You seem to have upset her. What did he do? No, it's nothing. It, it's just all this murder. It's so horrible. It came over me suddenly. I got to my room. Impossible. I can't believe it. What can't you believe? Six impossible things before breakfast like the Red Queen. Oh yes, it's rather like that. Dear me, you look as though you've seen a ghost. I've just seen something that I should have seen before. Blind as a bat I've been, but now I think we may be able to get somewhere. You mean the police have a clue? Yes, Mr. Wren, the police have a clue. <laughs> I want everyone assembled here again. Do you know where they are? Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Ralston are in the kitchen. I've been helping Major Metcalf look for your skis. Uh, we've looked in the most entertaining places, but uh, all to no avail, I'm afraid. I don't know where Mr. Favaccini is. I'll get him. You get the others. Mr. Favaccini! Mr. 
Paravicini. Paravicini. Looking for me, Sergeant? What can I do for you? This fellow policeman has lost his skis and doesn't know where to find them. Leave them alone and they'll come home. I'm dragging a murderer behind What is all this? Uh, sit down, Major. Mrs. Ralston. Must I come now? It's very inconvenient. There are more important things than meals, Mrs. Ralston. Mrs. Boyle, for instance, won't be wanting another meal. That's a very crude way of putting things, Sergeant. I'm sorry, but I want cooperation, and I intend to get it. Mr. Ralston, you please go get Miss Casewell. She went upstairs. Uh, tell her it'll only be for a few minutes. If you excuse me, fair Sergeant. No, Major. But I may say I have a very shrewd suspicion of who took them and of why they were taken. I won't say any more at the present moment. Please don't. I always think explanations should be kept to the very end. That exciting last chapter, you know. This isn't a game, sir. Isn't it? Mother, I think you are wrong. I think it is a game to somebody. You Do you, Mr. Mother Red? Is enjoying himself. Maybe. Maybe. What is happening? Sit down, Miss Casewell. Mrs. Ralston. Now, we won't pay attention, please. You may remember that at the, after Mrs. Boyle was killed, I took statements from you all. Those statements related to your positions at the time the murder was committed. Those statements were as follows. Mrs. Ralston in the kitchen. Mr. Ralston in his bedroom. Mr. Wren in his bedroom. Mr. Paravicini in the drawing room playing piano. Miss Casewell in the library. Major Metcalf in the cellars. Correct. Those were the statements you made. I had no means of checking them. They may be true, they may not. To put it quite clearly, five of those statements are true, one is false. Which one? Five of you were telling me the truth. One of you was lying. I have a plan that may help me to de decide who lied to me. And if I know who the liar is, then I know who the murderer is. Not necessarily. Someone may have lied for some other reason. I rather doubt that. You've just said you had no means of checking these statements. No. But suppose everyone was to go through the action, the same actions, a second time. Ah, that old chestnut. Reconstruction of the crime. That's a foreign idea. Not a reconstruction of the crime, Mr. Paravicini. A reconstruction of the actions of apparently innocent persons. What do you hope to gain by that? You will forgive me if I don't make that quite clear. You want a repeat performance, then? Yes, Mr. Ralston, I do. It's a trap. What do you mean, it's a trap? It is a trap, I know it is. I only want people to do exactly as they did before. Well, I don't see you. Well, I simply can't see what you can hope to find out by making people do exactly as they did before. I think it's nonsense. You can count you me out. Ren. I can't count anybody out. One might think you're all guilty by the looks of you. Good Lord, why are you all so unwilling? Of course, what you say goes, Sergeant. We'll all cooperate, eh, Molly? Very well. Mr. Wren? Miss Casewell? Yes. Mr. Paravicini? Oh, yes, I can sense. And Major Metcalf? Yes. You want us to do exactly as we did before? The same actions will be performed, yes. Then I will return to the piano in the drawing room. Once again, one finger. I shall pick out the signature tune of a murder. Not quite so fast, Mr. Paravicini. Mrs. Ralston, do you play piano? Yes. Do you know the tune of Three Blind Mice? Yeah, we all. Then you could pick the tune out with one finger as Mr. Paravicini did. I think so. Good, then will you please go into the drawing room and sit at the piano and be ready to play when I give you the signal. But Sergeant, I understood that we were each to repeat our former roles. The same actions will be performed, yes. Not necessarily by the same people. Thank you, Mrs. Ralston. I don't see the point. There is a point. It's a means of checking up on the original statements. And maybe one statement in particular. Now we all pay attention as I assign you to your new places. Mr. Wren, will you go to the kitchen 
Uh, just keep an eye on Mrs. Ralston's dinner for her. I believe you're very fond of cooking. <clears throat> Mr. Paravicini, will you go up to Mr. Wren's room? By the back stairs in the most convenient way. Major Metcalf, would you go up to Mr. Ralston's room and check the extension telephone there? Miss Casewell, will you please go down to the cellars? Mr. Wren will show you the way. I need someone to reproduce my own actions. I'm sorry to ask it of you, Mr. Ralston, but will you go out by this window and trace the telephone wire around to the front door? Rather chilly job, but you're probably the toughest person here. Well, what are you going to do, Sergeant? I am enacting the part of Mrs. Boyd. Taking a bit of a risk, aren't you? Now we all go to your stations and remain there until you hear me call you. Parlor games. No objection to my wearing an overcoat? No, I should advise it, sir. Oh, and take my torch. It's behind the curtain. Mrs. Ralston, count 20 and then begin to play. Better 
Someone's hidden my skis. And I can't find them. Oh, but it doesn't matter. It's been such fun. I don't mind if I get caught. I've had such a good time watching you all and pretending to be a policeman. That report will make a lot of noise. It will, rather. Much better to do it in the usual way and take you by the throat. The last little mouse in the trap. Three blind mice. Three blind mice. Stop it, Georgie, stop it! You remember me, don't you? You remember the fawn? And the animals? And that fat old pig? And the day the bull chased us across the field? And the dogs? Dogs? Yes, spot and plain. Kathy? Yes, Kathy, you remember me now, don't you? Kathy, it is you. But what are you doing here? I came to England to find you. I didn't recognize you until you twirled your hair the way you always used to do. Yes, you always did it. Georgie, come with me. You're coming with me. Where are we going? I'm going to take you somewhere. I'm going to take care of you. And you won't do any more harm. Carlson! Carlson! Molly, darling, are you all right? Don't. No, but whoever would have dreamt it was Trotter. He's mad. Quite mad. Yes, but you... I was mixed up in it all. I told at the school of those children when he thought I could have saved his brother. You should have told me. I wanted to forget. <laughs> Everything's under control. He'll be unconscious soon with his sedative. His sister's looking after him. Poor fellow's mad as a hatter, of course. I've had my suspicions of him all along. Why? Did you believe he was a policeman? I knew he wasn't a policeman. And you see, Mrs. Wilson, I'm a policeman. You? When we found that notebook from Montreal Manor written in it, we realized it was vital, vital to have a man on the spot. When it was put to him, Major Metcalf agreed to let me go in his place. I couldn't understand it when Trotter showed up. In case well as his sister? Yes, it seems she recognized him just after this latest business. Didn't know what to do. Unfortunately, came to me just in time. Well, he starts to thaw. Helps to be here soon. I'll bring down the skis from where I hid them above the floor poster. Was part of well, I gather they'll examine that car of his pretty well. I shouldn't be surprised if they found a thousand or so Swiss watches in a spare wheel. Yes, that's his line of business, that's a little bit of goods. Molly, I believe you thought John, I was... John, why did you commit on this today? I went to buy you an anniversary present. We've been married a year today. Oh. Yes. That's why I went, and I didn't want you to do. No. There's cigars. Oh, how delightful. Do you know they're all right? They're splendid. You smoke them? I'll smoke them. What's my present? Oh, I almost forgot. It's a hat. Am I practically now a well? I'm just for vest. It's lovely. Put it on. Lady, my well, hair's done properly. Oh, I hope you like it. The lady in the shop said it was the latest in hers. <laughs> She'll be all right. It's lovely. It's a terrible smell of burning coming from the kitchen. I'm fine! 